It was in 1789 that a man called Benjamin Franklin, who most of us here would have heard of at some time, he said these words, Our new constitution is now established. Everything seems to promise it will be durable. But in this world, nothing is certain except death and taxes. And you know, that quest, that endless pursuit to find a way of circumventing death of escaping death, or at, least, or at least of lengthening life, has been the pursuit of many scientists, philosophers. In fact, in uh, California and in Cambridge, there are two, um, we might call them think tanks, universities, filled with graduates from university, people that are paid millions of dollars to try and discover what the answer is to lifespan and they have coined this new term which is called health span if they can't um, continue life indefinitely at least what can they do to extend the quality of life of people and so these companies spend millions and millions of dollars a year and they're funded by people such as Jeff Bezos who um, many of us would have heard of one of the richest men in the world and these people pay up to $2 million a year towards this research venture to try and find out the key to ending mortality. There are other scientists who study genetics, who study organisms like the hydra, which is a, a tiny little freshwater creature. And what they've discovered is that when it's stressed or it's injured, it splits. And so it just seems to perpetuate itself endlessly. And the thought is that maybe it holds the key to immortality the ability to regenerate itself endlessly, or the pando tree in Utah that lives for thousands of years. Scientists study it in the hope of one day finding the key to immortality. Now, it may surprise you to know that there was a time that in mankind's history where death was not certain, when in fact humans weren't mortal. The first three chapters of the Bible provide us with an account of creation and mankind upon it. And in those first few chapters, we find the answers to the questions that those scientists are trying to discover. Where did we come from? Why were we created? How did death enter the world? And how we can escape death's grip? And so what we hope to show you tonight that you don't need to spend millions. There is a simple solution to mortality in the Bible, and that's what we hope to look at tonight. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1 for a moment. We want to, before we look at the, the promise that was read to us tonight, we want to just set some context leading up to that. Genesis chapter 1, the first book of the Bible, it tells us in verse 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. That was at some undefined, undefined point in time. We don't know when it is. It doesn't really matter. It could have been billions of years ago. But what we do know is that around 6,000 years ago, God created things upon the earth as we, we know them today. And that creative work was accomplished in a period of six days, six literal days. I'd like you to turn over the page to... Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31. And here God sums up everything that's been created this way. God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. So it wasn't perfect, but it was very good. So Adam was made in a very good state and placed in a pristine environment in a place called Eden. Eden was an area that was eastward, we're told, eastward with respect to the land of Israel in what we might call um, Iraq. And we know that Adam had lots of freedom. He could basically do anything he wanted except one thing. There was one command that God gave him, and that was that he was not to eat of a particular tree that God has, had created. That tree was known as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we read of that prohibition given to Adam in chapter 2 in verses 16 and 17. 
And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. So it wasn't a request that was given to Adam, it was a command, a command that had a very clear consequence. The consequence was death. And we're going to have more to say about that later. So for a short period of time, Adam was alone in the garden. And then God provided for him a companion. We were told about this wife that was made for Adam. Her name was Eve. And we're told that in verse 21, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. So she was made differently to all the animals. All the animals were made from the dust of the ground. But Adam's companion was made from his rib. And that was to teach Adam that there was to be an empathy between him and his wife that did not exist between the animals of the animal kingdom. We note also in verse 25 that they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now, we said earlier that mankind was not always subject to death and that something happened to change that. And that something is described in chapter 3, which we had read for us tonight. As we said, Adam and Eve had liberty. They could do whatever they wanted to. There was just one commandment that they had to keep. And their resolve to keep that commandment was going to be tested by God. To this point, when we get to the beginning of chapter 3, they had been unwavering in keeping that commandment. They had no impulse to disobey, no reason to question what they had been told. But their fidelity was about to be tested. Enter the serpent in Genesis chapter 3 verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. This serpent is, is quite an interesting creature. We're told he was more subtle and that subtlety allowed him to be perhaps more observant than all the other animals. And not only that, to to have a limited capacity to reason. So he observed what he saw and then he reasoned about what he saw and drew some conclusions. And this quality of being subtle is not a bad quality. In fact, in most places in the Bible, it's rendered as the word prudent. So the serpent was not a moral creature. He wasn't able to think on a moral plane or take into account moral principles. Yet he was part of all of that creation that is referred to as very good. So there's nothing sinister about this serpent. He's just a beast of the field that has some unusual qualities, including the power of speech. Now that seems unusual to us. If you've got a parrot, it may not seem so unusual. But in fact, in the Bible, in Numbers 22, we find that there was another animal that had the power of speech, that God gave the power of speech to, and that was an ass. So the serpent became aware of this commandment that had been given to Adam and Eve, and so it posed a question to the woman. It said in verse 1 of chapter 3, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman responds very um, forthrightly in verses 2 and 3, very unequivocally. The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. Sorry, we, uh, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. But that sort of reasoning didn't compute with the serpent. It thought about what it saw 
And it went down a different thought path. And its thought path was like this. It thought, well, hang on a minute. If they eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, well, that would make them like the angels. And the angels don't die. So there's not a problem here. They can eat of that tree. And look, apart from that, they can eat of the tree of the knowledge, uh, sorry, eat of the tree of life, which was also in the garden. And they would have life in any case. So he makes this proposition to the woman in um, verses 4 and 5. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Tragically, the seed of doubt placed in the mind of the woman by the serpent conceived and brought forth sin. The woman first doubted what God said, then she disbelieved, then she disobeyed. And not only that, we're told in verse 6 that she enticed her husband to do the same. <clears throat> And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. <coughs> now, it's clear that the woman was taking the leadership here. The husband had heard the discourse between her and the serpent, but he didn't intervene. And in elsewhere in the Bible, we read that Adam was not deceived. The woman was deceived, but Adam wasn't. And so the consequences that God had said to Adam that would come to pass if he ate of that tree were now a reality. They were no longer very good. They were now mortal, corrupting, and destined to return to the dust from which they were created. Adam and Eve understood that. They understood there was coming a time when they would perish and return to the dust, a state without consciousness. And their, conse their consequences of their actions have touched every man, woman, and child that has ever lived on the face of the earth. In fact, I can't think of any other event in the history of the world that has impacted every individual in a material way. This event did when this couple partook of that fruit. Why? Well, you see, because their mortality was now passed down to their offspring and to every generation. And not only that, the pristine environment in which Adam and Eve were placed would now become the arena of sin, disease, violence, and death. So the paradise that God created was short-lived. Adam and Eve, for the first time, experienced a knowledge of good and evil, they were now conscious of their nakedness, so they were ashamed. We read of that in verse 7. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. They were now afraid of the angels. Previously, they had enjoyed the company of the angels, but now they were afraid and they sought to hide themselves. So we see that sin brought fear shame and concealment. 930 years later, Adam finally succumbed to mortality and as foretold, he died. What became of him? Well, as was said, from the dust he was made and unto the dust he was, would return. You know, there was nothing said to Adam and Eve Adam and Eve that gave them reason to believe that death would be immediately followed by some new life in some other realm or in some other form. Death was a punishment of non-existence. 
not a gateway to another life. And so during that 930 years of life, Adam experienced hardship and toil as he laboured to produce food. In sorrow, he ate of the ground all the days of his life. Before we go on, I want to just take a slight digression for a couple of minutes and just consider the question, can we really believe what we're reading here? Like there are some things here which are not usual to us. There is a woman being created from the rib of a man. We've got a serpent that can speak. Did this really happen? Can we, can we trust this? Well, consider these few verses. These are all passages taken from the New Testament and show us that Christ and the Apostle Paul believed in the things that we've read tonight in the Genesis record. For example, in Mark chapter 10, it says, But from the beginning, and these are the words of Christ, but from the beginning of, crea of the creation, God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain, but one flesh. Now that, those few words that are highlighted there are actually a quotation from Genesis chapter 2 in verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. So Christ believed in the account of creation, and there are other passages which we could turn up, but in the interest of time, we've just got a few here. We find Adam and Eve mentioned by name in 1 Timothy chapter 2. We're told in verse 14 of chapter 2, Adam was not deceived. He knew what he was doing when he ate of the fruit unlike Eve, but the woman was deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. And in 2 Corinthians 11, the Apostle Paul makes reference to the serpent. He understood the serpent to be literal. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. I want to now just pause and consider what we've read and the implications of it. Consider the gravity of what we're reading. We're told that sorrow, lifelong sorrow and death would be the consequence for eating a piece of fruit. Was that fair? Was that reasonable? If so, on what grounds? From a human perspective, we would say, it seems that the, the punishment doesn't fit the crime. I mean, what legal system in the world would, would have a punishment of death for eating a piece of fruit? How do we reconcile this? Well, firstly, we learn that God keeps his word. He did exactly what he said he would do. He said, if you eat of that tree, you will die. If he didn't do what he said, then he couldn't be trusted. Secondly, we need to appreciate that this wasn't really about just eating a piece of fruit. It was really a test of obedience. Adam and Eve were made with free will. They had the choice to obey or disobey. God gave that choice to them, and it was not onerous to comply with what he said. We may say, well, was there a need to test their obedience in the first place? Well, let's keep our perspective right here that God didn't need to create them at all, but he did. He created them very good, and it was his, as part of his plan to test their obedience as a means of developing their character, and so he does with us. Fair enough, you say, but why was the punishment so severe? Death was the punishment. Surely there could have been some other way of developing their character. How is that fair? The answer is simple and incontestable, and that is what we read of here shows us what God thinks about sin. Disobedience is sin, whether it results from being beguiled or not. And you know, 
We live in a world where man is the arbiter of what is right and wrong. Man today in many respects calls right wrong and wrong right, evil good and good evil. So how then, given all of that, how then do we reconcile God's judgment with him being a merciful heavenly father? Well, if there wasn't more to the story that we would have to conclude that God was right, but he wasn't a God of mercy. But you see, there is more to the story. Adam and Eve weren't left in despair. They were given a hope, a hope, in fact, that they could attain to an even better state than very good. And therein is revealed the mercy of God. So although he had imposed death as the wages of sin, he opened up a way that made eternal life possible. How was that possible? Well, that really brings us to the title of tonight's address, God's Promise in Eden. God rightfully could have left Adam and Eve without a hope, but he didn't. Instead, he graciously gave them a promise. And that was the seed of hope. And tonight we're going to look at how you and I can participate in that hope. To understand the the significance of the promise, we firstly really need to fully appreciate the impact of the sin upon Adam and Eve and all their offspring. We've already seen how sin affected their bodies. They became mortal. They become dying creatures. But you see, sin also affected their thinking. Let's read Genesis chapter 3, verse 6 again. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Eve was enticed when she saw that the tree was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, desired to make one wise. You know, the Bible refers to those three things that enticed Eve as the lust of the flesh, the the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And this is what the Apostle John has to say about those three things. Excuse me. He says, For all that is in the world... The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not not of the Father, but is of the world. So what he's saying is that those lusts that are now present in all of us, in all of mankind, didn't come from him. So where did they come from? Well, they were one of the consequences of sin. And that's critical to understanding this promise that we're about to read of in a short while. You know, we don't need to look very far in Genesis to see, to find proof that that very good state was lost. You know, in the very next chapter, we read about the first murder in the Bible. And in chapter 6 and verse 5, actually we might turn over there to chapter 6 and verse 5, this is in the days of Noah it says and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually the Bible uses one word to sum up our nature with all its sinful propensity And that one word is this. No, sorry, I should have mentioned before I go there. When the serpent aroused those lusts in Adam and Eve for unlawful purposes, they obeyed those and they obeyed those lusts. Their original very good state was lost, and their posterity inherited a nature with a tendency to sin. To which all have succumbed. So, what's the term that the Bible uses to sum up mankind's fallen nature 
with all of its propensities and those lusts. It's this one word, flesh. Flesh is synonymous with human nature. And to help us grasp what God thinks of flesh, we need to consider this verse. If ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. You know, that's pretty confronting, isn't it? Those lusts of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life are such an inherent part of us and we so easily succumb to them. But God says if we obey them, that the end is death. No hope beyond the grave. So just to be clear, our nature does not alienate us from God, but serving it does. So as a result of sin, man became locked into this cycle of sin and death. However, God made a promise in verse 15 of this chapter that breaks that cycle. And that cycle is broken by one who is called the seed of the woman. Let's read that in Genesis 3 verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shall bruise his heel. It's unusual language, isn't it? It's not language we're accustomed to. We can search the Bible from from cover to cover, and nowhere will we find an occasion where we have a man standing on the head of a serpent and a serpent biting his heel. What we're being told here is that this verse is intended to be understood as an allegory. It's both a prophecy and an allegory. Bad. This verse describes a conflict, a conflict between two parties, the serpent and its seed and the woman and her seed. So what do the serpent and the woman represent? They're figures which are representative of ideas or principles. So what are they? They represent, the serpent and the woman represent the type of thinking that they manifested. The serpent uttered false teaching and so it represents what the Bible calls the thinking of the flesh. And that thinking, as I said, is inherent in human nature. This mode of thinking tells us you ought to obey the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It comes naturally. It's what you should do. Do it. That's the thinking of the flesh. The woman, on the other hand, spoke the truth in the first instance. She, therefore, represents what the Bible calls spiritual thinking, or we might term it the thinking of the spirit. Hope. These, this mode of thinking tells us to obey God. So these two modes of, of thinking, the thinking of the flesh and the thinking of the spirit, what we find is that they're referred to in many places in the Bible and they're often put uh, in contrast to one another. We have an example of that in Romans chapter 8, where it says this, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now the term spirit here is just simply a way of saying a a thinking that has been influenced by God And for us, that comes from the Bible. So if we read and absorb the principles of the Bible, we we, um, develop spiritual thinking. It's not some other other sort of um, thing that we can get without the influence of God's Word. So there are two types or two modes of thinking. One leads to death. And one leads to life and peace. And it's useful at this point just to know that, that the thinking of the flesh is referred to in, in other ways, such as to be carnally minded. 
So to return then to the allegory, God said, I will put enmity, and that word means hatred, between the serpent and the woman, or in other words, between the thinking of the serpent and the thinking of the spirit. Eve had not previously experienced that enmity, that conflict. The condition of her nature had now changed and she experienced this conflict within herself, a conflict between those two modes of thinking. There were now two forces competing for the control of her body, the impulses of her nature and the thinking of the spirit. And they were direct opposites. And the Apostle Paul describes that internal conflict in these words. The flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and these are contrary one to the other. And what we find is that as a person develops spiritual thinking, that that conflict intensifies. It's like the impulses of the flesh within us say, this is my place, this is my home, this is where I live, and I don't want any other influences. And so there is this growing conflict between spirit and flesh. We're also told in verse 15, Genesis 3 verse 15, that that enmity would also exist between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. Now, this word seed is a fairly flexible sort of word. It, it means offspring, but it can refer to a singular offspring or a plural offspring. Now, we have an example in just across the page in chapter 4, verse 25, illustrates how it can be used in a singular sense. Chapter 4, verse 25, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God sits said she, hath appointed me another seed, singular, instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And similarly, in Genesis 3.15, the woman's seed is singular, for it says at the end of the verse, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And in fact, in many other translations, it doesn't say it shall bruise thy head, it says he shall bruise thy head. <clears throat> the seed of the serpent, on the other hand, is, has a more general application to those who allow their lives to be governed by the flesh. Now, the end of the verse tells us that this conflict was to reach a climax, a battle to the death between the seed of the serpent Oh, sorry, the seed of the woman and the serpent. So let's have a look more closely at that. It says, he shall bruise thy head. Now this word bruised, it means to gape, to open widely. So imagine the effect of a gaping wound to your head. It's telling us it was to be fatal, a fatal blow to the serpent. That is to the thinking of the serpent. What does it mean to deliver a blow to the thinking of the flesh? Well, it simply means to bring its power to an end. When we think about just how insidious those lusts are and how difficult it is to combat them, then we quickly realize that what we're reading here of the crushing of the serpent's head is a superhuman feat. On the other hand, the serpent would bruise his heel. And by contrast, the wound to the heel of a man is to un be understood as a wound from which a person can recover. So what's this conflict describing? Well, here's a synopsis. It's saying this, that a descendant of the woman would come who would not yield to the thinking of the flesh, thereby destroying its power over himself. He would suffer in the conflict, but emerge victorious. 
Now, you may be thinking by now, well, there's a lot of imagery here. There's, it's an allegory and we've got symbols. What is it? How did this actually play out in real life? Well, it all becomes much more obvious and simple when we identify who the seed of the woman is. So let's explore that a little bit further. The seed of the woman had to experience the promptings of the flesh, but not succumb to them. Therefore, this seed of the woman had to possess human nature, but also it had to possess the capacity to overcome them. No man has ever been able to do that except for one person, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the seed of the woman spoken of here. So let's spend a few moments seeing how Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of this prophecy. <laughs> Firstly, we know that the seed would be of the woman. It's obvious, isn't it, that any descendant from Eve was going to be of her. So what is this really saying? Well, he's called the seed of the woman to indicate this, that he would not be of the man, that God would be his father. Galatians chapter 4 puts it this way, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. What's the relevance of that? Well, you see, in order to conquer human nature, Jesus had to possess it, but not succumb to it. He had to experience temptation in order to conquer it. And from Mary, he inherited mortal human nature, but from God, he inherited a capacity to overcome temptation. So that's the first thing. He was both made of the woman, but son of God. The second point is this, that in his life, Jesus conquered the thinking of the flesh by never succumbing to it. And Hebrews has this to say, <clears throat> For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. It's really the second part of that verse that we're particularly interested in. He was able to do what no other man could do. He never sinned. He never succumbed to those three lusts. And his temptation in the wilderness, as recorded by Matthew, Mark and Luke, testified to that his um, overcoming of those three lusts. There was no temptation that we experienced that he didn't. But whereas we sometimes fall, he never did. He was sinless. So in his life, he never succumbed to sin. But there is another aspect to how Christ crushed the head of the serpent, how he conquered sin. You see, in his death, Jesus conquered the thinking of the flesh by ending its power over him. And Romans chapter 8 says, for what, the law could, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. When Jesus took his last breath on the cross, the power of flesh was brought to an end once and for all. And Romans chapter 8 and verse 3 describes the victory that way. What's it saying? Well, first of all, that Christ was in the likeness of sinful flesh. In other words, he was of the same nature as us. But secondly, it's saying that by his obedience unto death, even the death of the cross, that sin was condemned. Even to the point of surrendering his life, Christ was obedient right to the end. 
and sin never had a chance. It was condemned in that final act of obedience by Jesus Christ. So we've seen how Christ bruised the head of the serpent, but how was it that the serpent bruised his heel? Well, what we know is this, that Jesus' teaching brought brought him into prominence with the people, but also into conflict with the Jewish religious leaders of the day. They were, in the terms of Genesis 3.15, the seed of the serpent. And eventually, in order to, to silence him, they falsely accused him and arranged his crucifixion by the Roman authorities. They manifested the thinking of the flesh, and as such were, we might say, the representatives of the serpent. Appropriately, there, appropriately therefore, John the Baptist called the Pharisees and, and Sadducees a generation of vipers, and he's alluding directly to Genesis 3, verse 15. <laughs> now, we said earlier that the bruise that was inflicted by the serpent was to the heel, indicating a blow that was a blow from which a person could recover. Yet here we're saying that Christ died in order to fulfill the prophecy. How do we reconcile that? Well, simply this, that you see Jesus rose from the dead on the third day and subsequently his body was changed from mortal human nature to an immortal spirit body, no longer subject to sin. And so in that sense, he emerged victorious. So, we've talked a lot about Genesis 3.15 and how this seed of the woman came, Jesus Christ, who would conquer sin. Now, if you're a thinking person, you'll be saying, okay, I can understand that, but what does it do for me? This is a promise about a man conquering sin I can't do that. So how do I benefit from this? Well, the answer is God cannot ignore sin, but he can cover it. And when you cover something, you can't see it. So how does God cover sin? Psalm 32 says this, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven and his, and whose sin is covered. So to forgive sin in Bible language is to cover sin. So on what basis does God forgive sin? Or on what basis does he cover sin? And the answer is, well, we're told in the remainder of Genesis chapter 3. It's going to answer that question for us. Now, you'll recall when we read Genesis chapter 3, we read that Adam and Eve tried to cover their nakedness. How? By fig leaves. But God said, no, no, that's not how I cover sin. There is a way, but it's my way. And God showed them how that way was. God wanted to make it clear to them and to us that God can't cover sin that we try to hide. And God's way of covering sin is is told to us in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. And the providing of a covering, this providing of a covering seems disconnected from the promise, but actually it showed Adam and Eve how they could be associated with it, how they could benefit from it. The promise said there was going to come a man who would be able to conquer sin, who would never sin. They couldn't do that. How could they benefit? Verse 21. You see, here again in this verse we have principles taught by types. The animal that was slain to provide the coat represents Christ. How do we know that? 
We don't have time to turn to it, but Revelation 13 verse 8. There Christ is called the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Therefore, to put on the skin of the Lamb was in a figure to put on Christ. By putting on the skin of the Lamb, nakedness was covered. And by putting on Christ, our sins are covered. So what does it mean to put on Christ? Galatians chapter 3. For as many of you as have been baptised into Christ have put on Christ. So baptism is an outward demonstration of an inner conviction. And that conviction is this that God is right in condemning sin as shown by Christ and that we want to live a life free from sin. In baptism, a person is momentarily totally immersed in water. They can't breathe. It's like a watery death. It's a symbolic death, an end to an old way of life wherein we lived according to our lusts. On the other hand, their emergence from the water is the symbolic resurrection. It's like the beginning of a new life. We were no longer subject to the impulses of our nature. So in a symbolic act, a person dies with Christ and is raised with Christ. So baptism into Christ provides a covering or forgiveness for sins that are past. As we read in Acts, then Peter said unto them, Repent, that is, change your way of life. Stop obeying the lusts of the flesh and start thinking according to the Spirit of God. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission or forgiveness of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So to return back to Genesis chapter 3, just as we put on Christ in baptism, Adam and Eve put on Christ by being clothed with the skin of an animal that represented Christ. Both the covering with skins and baptism are symbolic ways of associating with Christ's condemnation of sin. Both are a means of obtaining forgiveness. So then, we see that verse 21 of Genesis 3 is intimately connected with verse 15. We might put it this way, that in verse 15, God provides a door to hope, and in verse 21 is contained the key to open that door. Verse 21 showed Adam and Eve how they could associate with and benefit from the promise. And so, whereas Adam and Eve look forward to the coming of the seed of the woman, we, on the other hand, look back in faith. So we've seen how we can put on Christ as a covering for our sins that are past by being baptised. But what about life after baptism? See, baptism is just the beginning. It's a public declaration that we are committed of what we are committed to doing lifelong. So what does a life in Christ look like? We're going to quote a few verses here, but I think it's worthwhile doing it to give us a, a bit of a, a rounded view of what life in Christ looks like after baptism. <clears throat> and we're going to notice as we read through this, so I'd like you to see if you can identify two words that we've spoken of a lot tonight that describe two modes of thinking. This I say then, walk in the Spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh and these are contrary the one to the other so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, 
fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envying, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, the day which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Did you notice those two words? Spirit and flesh. Yes. What's the point? What's the apostle telling us here? Or what's the relevance of this for tonight? That is that a believer, after they're baptized, must commit to a lifelong battle. To a battle to contend against the impulses from the flesh. We will never get the flesh to follow the lead of our mind. It will always want to disobey God. And so the Apostle Paul says in another place, I die daily. And we can see in the sort of language that the Apostle uses here in that second last line, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh. That tells us about the intensity of the conflict that we could expect in the life of a believer. So with that in mind, we say, wow, if that's what's expected of a person to please God, what's the incentive? I mean, to die daily, to crucify the flesh is obviously a struggle till the end of our life. So what's the incentive to do that? Well, a person, we might say, who is in their right mind would not want to do that. But I would say to you, a person who is in their right mind would say the choice is easy. The world is filled with uncertainty, suffering, pain, oppression, sorrow, anxiety and loneliness. All without hope. What God is offering is certainty, peace, stability true unity, perfect companionship, mutual love, a desire to live, boundless energy and purposeful existence. That's certain. You know, we live in a world where even the leaders of our country, they make a promise and they don't keep it. The difference here with God is he keeps his promises. As we we're told at the beginning of this presentation, God has made three key promises to mankind and he's going to fulfill every one of them. And our offer is to participate in them. So these words are written by the man who said, I die daily. He begins by saying, if we looked to this life for our reward, we would be, or well, sorry, he goes on to say in this passage in 1 Corinthians 15, so this is written by the man who said, I die daily. He said, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we're of all men most miserable. So he acknowledges that a life in Christ is a challenge. And he says, if there's nothing, no reward after this life, then we're most miserable. Why would you do it? But he goes on to say, but now Christ is risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so those that are in Christ, they shall all be made alive. And he's talking here about eternal life. But every man in his own order, 
Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. So there is coming a time when those who are in Christ, when those who have put on that covering through baptism, will be raised from the dead. God has provided a door of hope to those who want something better, to those who want something certain. He's made us a promise. Our prayer is that you will take the key and unlock the door. 